Praise the Lord. Boy, that is such a truth there. There is no one like our God. Out of all of the belief systems, and I know I've said this to you a couple of times over the last few weeks, out of all the belief systems in the world, uh, including every religion and every cult that, that it is out there, uh, our God is the only God that moves with compassion and concern and sympathy and love. All the others are harsh and have to be served, or sacrificed to in order to spare your life. They're non-existent. They're in some cosmos somewhere. But only Jehovah God, only our God, only the God of the Bible is the only God that moves mercifully on people and with compassion and personally in our lives. So there is no other God, even if you think there's one, there's no other God like our God. How many, you know, years ago, up until the last, oh gosh, man, what, uh, 10 years or so where things, Bible uh, apps have become so popular and, you know, I mean, I know they existed before 10 years ago, but nowadays in church, uh, hardly anybody ever carries a Bible with them. Is there anybody in the building with a Bible in your now that you're looking at? And I mean, I, I mean, a book. <laughs> you know, the, that that thing they used to call a book. You know, has pages in it that you turn. That old timey thing. Um, of course, that's what what I grew up with. And up until about ten years ago, any time you started a message, you would say, "All right, everybody, turn with me to the Book of Esther, or whatever book it would be." And I wish that we all had Bibles today because I would say, turn with me to the book of Esther so I could watch all of you struggle to try to find the book of Esther. Uh, it's not one of those books that a lot of people read, but it is the greatest book, guys. It's the most interesting things that you can imagine. It, God's name is not mentioned one time in the entire book but yet you can't read it, and you'll see, because we'll, we'll read a good bit of uh, passages from different places in it, without seeing God's footprints just all over the book. The only time that you even come close to God being mentioned is when the people were gonna pray and fast and pray for something, but uh, it never mentions or has any allusion to God uh, saving them or anything like that. So it's just interesting that I, most people are not aware that there is a book in the Bible that does not even mention the name of God, and this is it, the book of Esther. Uh, if it helps you, it's right before the book of Job. So that ought to help you know where it is. It's right there on that screen. It's easy to find, isn't it? <laughs> just type in. Um, but anyway, man, people used to when they would, this is the way people would, would do. Uh, they had the Bible on their lap, and you'd say, a passage, and if they didn't know where it was, most of the time people were too embarrassed to look at in the table of contents, because heaven knows, if you don't know where every book in the Bible is, you are not spiritual whatsoever. So we couldn't have, and if you look in a table of contents, it sure means you don't know where it is. So what would happen is people would, uh, they'd look at their neighbor and see about how many pages they had turned on one side, and then they'd kind of turn about like that and try to hope it got there. But if it didn't, they didn't do it again. They just let it stay in wherever it was open to and just acted like they were reading it right along with everybody else. <clears throat> That's one of the reasons why I like to put the words up on the screen because... Um, it, it means everybody can see them at the same time, and we're not all here fumbling around trying to find them and look at them, because I do, I do believe that it matters that you see the Word. It, it impacts me more when I see it and hear it, obviously, than if I just hear it, because sometimes it's just seeing that, and, and you see something there that the Holy Spirit you know, wants you to see that might be highlighted for you and your heart, it just pops up. And, but for all of us, we've just gone on, you know. And, but for you, you see something. And I know that's the way the Lord speaks through his word many times. So I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about the book of Esther because the book of Esther is a book of assurance. It, it assures us that God is ultimately in control of everything and that even though it looks like evil is winning, evil always gets its comeuppance. And God always protects his people like he said he would. And that even though things might look terribly bad and it looks like the strategies of the Satan are working in every way and it seems like 
every imagination of evil is prospering and moving forward and that we're getting damaged and hurt by it, that you can always count on God to keep his word. And his word is that he's going to protect us. There's a passage that I have it on a t-shirt and I'm gonna make some more of these t-shirts because uh, I can't find any more of them. And every time I wear, I've got two or three that are thread thread bare. They've been worn so much. And every time I wear them, wherever it is, grocery store, wherever it might be, somebody says, man, I like that shirt. Because on the front, it says Isaiah, it says Isaiah 54 right down here, verse 17. And then on the front, it says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And then on the back, it says, God's got my back. That's what verse Isaiah says in Isaiah 54. This is, uh, this is about 600 years before Jesus is born. Here's what Isaiah the prophet said to all of us for us to receive. Verse 16, Isaiah 54, verse 16, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler. Everybody say destroyer. That's what he's talking about. I've created the destroyer. And his job is to destroy. So God is just telling you, he, you know, good things and bad things. He's, he's the creator of all of that stuff. Now here's verse 17, very next verse. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So the book of Esther is about the Lord keeping that promise about no weapon formed against us will prosper because the Lord has our back and he's gonna put down those things that come against us. And so in the book of Esther, we see a man and it's a a story of a man who ends up being hung in his own, in in the noose that he's prepared uh, for someone else. So let's just jump in and I wanna jump in in chapter three uh, of, of the book of Esther and let's read the first couple of verses or so. After these things, King Ahasuerus, which is, historians tell us is is Xerxes I of Persia, it doesn't really matter. Uh, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Verse 10, so the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. So Haman is gonna be the villain of this whole story, obviously, and I think you could probably tell that. He hates the Jews, so he is the enemy of God's chosen people. You remember God made a covenant with Abraham and the Jewish people became his people, his covenant people. And Haman hates them. And so he not only hates God's people, but he also, in effect, uh, hates God. And he is identified as an Agagite. And the only thing I want you to remember about that is some of you might, some of you Bible students may remember that uh, King Saul was told by Samuel the prophet to go and kill King Agag. Agag was the a, was a king of the Edomites, which came from, uh, from Esau. And the Bible says, God said, I am in perpetual battle against Esau. So Samuel the prophet told Saul, all right, go down there and kill King Agag and all of his stuff. Don't bring anything back with you. Not, don't bring any of his animals or anything, children, anything. Just, just kill everything. When Sam, and when Saul, uh, Saul got back, uh, Samuel said, did you do what God said? And Samuel said, I sure did. And Samuel says, well, what is that bleeding of the sheep I hear and the lowing of those cattle? In other words, if you did everything God said, why did you bring some of those animals back with you? And then Saul starts stuttering about, uh, he did it, he wanted to sacrifice to God and blah, blah, blah. Well, he also brought King Agag back, chained to the chariot wheel. And that ended up being a gigantic mess. And as a matter of fact, it was King Agag and his descendants that that actually killed Saul later uh, with an arrow that they just shot in the air and it pierced his armor. But anyway, just to say that um, 
that's who uh, Haman is. He's of that descendants, all right? And then you have Mordecai. Mordecai's a Jew. He's one of God's chosen people. Um, uh, and, and so in the book, you, you're seeing a conflict between Haman and Mordecai, which is more than just a conflict between Haman and Mordecai. Obviously, it's symbolic of, a, of the conflict between heaven and hell, between uh, light and darkness, between God and Satan. And, and of course, we find ourselves in the middle of this conflict because just like Mordecai, just like these people that were God's people, we find ourselves today in conflict with all kinds of satanically inspired people and drama in our life. And we find ourselves really in the midst of, of a time where um, evil is coming against us on every hand, especially against Christians. But you don't even have to be a Christian if you're just a moral person. If you're, if you're a person that just believes that something is right and something is wrong, that you just have some values of any kind. This world and these, and these enemies that are inspired by evil is the only thing, way you can put it, they're coming against us on every hand, and it seems more and more each day. Uh, so here, here we are, we're in the midst of this conflict. We're the Mordecais of life. We have many Hamans around, and we've gotta pay attention to the battle that we're being called to because sometimes we underestimate our enemy and we get hurt because we underestimate our enemy. I heard of a man, uh, had a <laughs> I had a dog, and the dog was always fighting with other dogs, but he was always getting whipped, beat up, torn up. And one of the guy's friends says, man, your dog's not much of a fighter, is he? And the guy said, well, he's a pretty good fighter. He's just not a good, he's just not a good judge of dogs. And you know, you, have to, you can't underestimate your enemies. It, you know, it does matter. Uh, that you recognize them and that you know who to come against and how to come against and so forth. So here it is. Let me introduce to you now the book of Esther. And we're gonna, I'm going to introduce to you Haman so that you can see him. And I'll guarantee you, as we look at Haman today, you're not going to be able to look at him and not think of these current things that are happening today. And some of the people that are involved that we see all the time. This is a good characterization. And I, I just want to tell you that God's trying to encourage us that he's in control. All right, so here we go. Let's just meet Haman, all right? And, and I'm going to, of course, they're all alliterated because that's what I do. And so we meet haughty Haman. I mean, some preacher habits die hard, right? All right, all right, so we meet him. We meet Haman, haughty Haman. All right, let's see him. Uh, Esther chapter three, verse two. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bound and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. So here's Haman. Haman loves to be praised. Haman loves for everybody to bow down when he walks down the street to pay homage to him. Well, after all, he's really a pretty big deal because it says that he's been promoted by the king to a really high political position. He's probably something like the like prime minister of this big country. This country that they're in, by the way, goes all the way from India to Ethiopia at that time, that, about 450 years before Jesus. So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a large land. So he, he really was a pretty big shot in this government thing. And when he was out walking his wife's poodle, he, you know, he loved for people to approach him and, you know, oh, Mr. Haman, oh, yes, it's a good day, sir, good day, sir. And, and he loved that. And the one thing that galled him was someone who would not do that. And here was Mordecai, Mordecai uh, picked, pricked his pride, dented his dignity, or whatever word you want to use for it. So Haman makes up his mind that he's going to have to do something about this one little fly in the ointment, this, this Mordecai. So here's Haman in his haughtiness, in his strut, in his pride, uh, as a picture of Satan and all of Satan-inspired people that we can so easily see. And remember now, it's pride that, uh, that caused the fall. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, Isaiah the prophet tells us that Lucifer was one of God's angels until pride was found in him. 
And he said, I'll exalt my throne above God. I'll, I'll, I'll rise above everything that's called to God. All the angels will fall down and worship me. And of course, that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. So pride was the, the original sin, actually. And also remember that pride is one of the major tools that, that the devil uses to send people to hell. And I know we don't think about this quite often because we think that it's stealing and killing and committing adultery and lying and you know all of that that sends somebody to hell. But there are many people that don't lie, steal, cheat, commit adultery, do anything like that. They just have this tremendous pride that will not allow them to bend to God. And I would say that pride probably sends more people to hell than any other sin. Just the fact that they're just not gonna surrender. As a matter of fact, Solomon told us about pride in Proverbs 6. Put it on the screen. There it is. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. What's the first one? A proud look. So in the list of the seven abominable sins, the first one God lists is pride. And then he goes on. Uh, you can check them out and make sure you're not doing any of that. Um, so Haman, Haman has a lot of dignity and, and Mordecai dents that dignity. And, and so Mordecai won't bow and, and so Mordecai represents all those people that won't bow, those people that won't bow down to the, uh, to the commands of someone else, some haughty person, some big wheel, some big shot. Uh, so there you have some conflict going. Second characteristic about Haman, hateful. Let's meet hateful Haman. I'm gonna read verse three through six in chapter three. Let's listen to it. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gates said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him that the people of uh, had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So. Haman not only hates Mordecai, but now by extension, he hates all of the people of Mordecai. He hates all of the Jews. So you can see that he's gonna run into trouble, right? We know this, why? Because as I mentioned, God made the covenant with Abraham. In Proverbs, I like this word because people get this verse wrong quite a bit. Pride, this is Solomon talking. Pride, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A lot of people quote that verse and they say pride goes before a fall. But that's not what it says. It says pride goes before destruction. So if you're full of pride, it leads to destruction. A haughty spirit is what leads you to stumble and fall. Uh, pretty much six and one half does. I just wanted to call that attention to that. But here, look, here's half the first part of the covenant that God made with Abraham, thereby the Jews. This is in Genesis 12. Look, this is, this is the Lord speaking to Abraham about what he's gonna do for the Jewish people, all right? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Haman's hatred for God's people is really a hatred for God himself because it was from the Jews that the word of God would come. Everything we have in the Bible came from the Jews and the son of God would be birthed through the Jews. So it's always been an inspiration, a satanic inspiration throughout the ages to kill the Jews. And we know this. We know in our modern time in World War II, Hitler did everything he could to wipe out all the Jews on the earth. Uh, he wasn't the first one. There were many kings that tried to wipe out all of the Jews on the earth. What is this intense, um, intangible hatred for the Jewish people? Why is it that today, as I'm speaking to you, this very day, 
that there are people all over the Mideast that basically want to kill every Jew that they can possibly see, and there is an intense hatred for them wherever they are. Well, it's a satanically inspired deal because God loves them, so it's really a hatred for God. Well, then in verse 9, uh, Haman comes up with a plan, and here it is. Verse nine, if it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So Haman says, I'm gonna tell you, king, look, we're gonna get, we need to get rid of all the Jews. And I'm gonna, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna spend my own money on this. Right, let's put a bounty. Let's put a bounty on them. Say, you kill a Jew, you get $100. And and I'll pay all the money that we have to pay these bounties myself, personally. I'll put my money. Uh, some biblical historians say that this, this was most likely millions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's a lot. It, it's a, a, I think it said 10,000 talents of silver. I mean, that's a lot of money. So anyway, uh, here's Haman, uh, who is so full of hatred and, and vengeance that he's willing to... Uh, put up his own money and, 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 and let's, let's declare open season on, these, on the Jews and let's get rid of them. And of course, we understand that uh, we're not Jewish people and we didn't take the place of Jewish people, by the way. There are some theologies that say, some Christian theologies that say uh, that when Jesus came and the Jews rejected him that, and we received him, that we took over their covenant with God and thereby we are the modern day nation of Israel, so to speak. But that's not true. God still has a covenant with Israel and he's still keeping his covenant with Israel and they have everything to do with what's happening now and what's happening into the future. It's just an amazing thing. But, but we recognize because we are God's people that this is also pertaining to us because we remember that, that the scripture tells us that all of us who live godly in Christ Jesus are gonna suffer persecution. I mean, that, that, that's kind of our, our lot in life. If you belong to Christ, this world is not going to honor you. Why? Because they didn't honor him. And Jesus said, a servant is not better than his master. If they hated me, they're gonna hate you. And so our problem is that we are twice born people in a world full of once born people and we try to live godly in, in, in Christ Jesus and we march to the beat of a different drummer. Our whole life is different. We start at a different source, we follow a different course and we, and we are moved by a different force. And we're contrary to this world and our thinking is contrary to this world. And so it's very easy to become a mark in this world. As a matter of fact, I was talking with someone this past week about some of these mandates that are being poured upon us and especially upon government people for, you know, you're gonna have to get the vaccine or you're gonna lose your job. It's mandated that you have the vaccine. Well, there are a lot of people who have objections to that. Not only, I mean, not, not only because they don't think anybody ought to be able to tell them that. That's the American coming out in you, by the way. I don't know if you, you know that. We Americans have that kind of nature where we say, you're not telling me what to do kind of deal. But it's not just that. Some people have uh, real objections. They have some, uh, some uh, religious objections, some physical objections, all kind of objections. And this person was telling me that, uh, that their business was requiring this and that uh, the only way that you could get out of it was to have a religious objection. And so you had to fill out a form and, and, and talk about your religious objection to this. And so they said when they were filling out the form, part of the objection, and, and you can follow this, I mean, remember people think and they believe and, and, and if they believe that this is a fact, then it's, a, it's an objection, it's a religious objection. But one of the objections was that it, that, the, that a mandate for a vaccine was simply a forerunner of a, of a mandate to receive a number whereby you could buy or sell or live life. So it, it, 
the objection was, I don't want to participate in something that is the forerunner of something that the Bible teaches me to stay away from. And whether you would agree with that objection or not, doesn't matter. What I want you to hear about it is when you start writing it down. Now, I want you to imagine writing down for some inspector, some human resources person who you don't know from Adam's house cat and you don't know whether they're a believer or non-believer, they've ever even read the Bible, heard about the Bible or whatever. And you've got to write down what you believe about that, that number that's going to be a number one day that's going to be, you're going to buy or sell or whatever. Now, am I, listen, let me say this real quick to you because I can see this going out. And you guys out there too, you better be listening. Am I saying that the vaccine is the mark of the beast? I am not saying that. I'm saying that it is a forerunner, which means it is, this is how it's going to happen. This is the same, this is just a practice round for it. It's just going to happen just like this. One of these days, according to the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, many other prophetic words, there's going to be a ruler in this world that's called the Antichrist. And he's going to require that everybody on this earth have a number in their forehead or on the back of their hand. And if you don't have that number that represents him, you're not going to be able to buy or sell or do anything. You're going to be hunted down and killed. Now that's what the Bible teaches specifically about that. So this is a practice round for that kind of thing. This is how you start forcing people all over the world to get something. You mandate it. And this is this is how it happens. So it's a forerunner to that. It is not the mark of the beast. First place, uh, I don't think it happened this quick. I think we'll be gone. But anyway, that's beside the point. But now, think about this. How would you write that out on a form and, and give it to somebody who you don't even know if they've ever even heard of the Bible? Well, I believe that there will be a uh, a de devilish evil man one day. I mean, just think, imagine how you would describe that. And when you start describing it, imagine that you were the one reading that who had never heard any of that before and how, how weird that would sound. It would be, what? And then you start reading, you say, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And, and you're a believer and you believe it, but I'm just saying that's an example of how out of step with the world our beliefs really are. And when you write them down and present them as something, it, they look, you know, kind of bizarre in many ways. Uh, and I'm a believer in every bit of it, so don't get me wrong. But if you just wrote it, wrote it down and tried to read it, it would be like, oh man, that does sound a little out there, you know, uh, kind of conspiracy theory kind of thing. But anyway, the point is, that's, that's why it's easy for us to become a target for people in this age in which we're living because our beliefs are so different than anything the world purports. All right, so we have haughty Haman, we have hateful Haman, look at this. All right, hilarious Haman. Yeah, had to start with an H. He's happy, and here's why he's happy. Look in verse 15, chapter three. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, which is the capital city, in the citadel. The citadel is just actually the palace. So the order went out in the capital city and around the palace. So the king and, say, and Haman sat down to drink. Now look at this. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. So the king and Haman are sitting there laughing and drinking, having a good old time giggling with each other. And the people in the city are going, what? What is the order? And imagine you can hear the Jews who live in that city realize that what has just happened is that they are now being threatened with extermination while Haman and the king sit around laughing and, and giggling and, and guffawing over this whole situation. And so in chapter four, verse three, uh, we get to see 
Haman's nature about this thing, and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So while everybody else was hurting, they were perplexed, they were filled with anxiety, they, they knew that they could be killed at any moment, and there was just a law that just said that that could happen. It, that means nothing to Haman. Haman is hilarious. Haman is happy. Haman is, is, is enjoying his time while everybody else is, is suffering. So here are the people of God. They're praying, and Haman and the king are drinking and laughing and giggling and so forth. So here's Haman. He's just in his pride and in his greed. He, he's happy about these things, and, but God's people are on their face, and, and they're praying. And remember, Isaiah said, no weapon formed against you going to prosper. So God's people are praying, and Haman is strategizing. So let's meet the fourth characteristic, heartbroken Haman. Yeah, something begins to fall apart. Chapter 5, verse 9. So Haman went out that day, joyful and with a glad heart, and when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. So Haman has everything going his way. He has everything he wants, but he's still not happy because there's a fly in the ointment. Mordecai will not give him the respect that he demands. And so he's going to do something drastic about it. Now, let me fill you in on just a little bit behind the scenes that you need to know. I started at chapter three, reading the story. In the first couple of chapters, here's what happens. There's a, there's a king and a queen of this province, of this country. The queen's name is Vashti. She's beautiful. She's been queen for 25 years. She is commanded by the king and, uh, and to appear before him, and she doesn't. So she disrespects the king. So she's, she's out. So to get a new king, they have a beauty contest. And they have all the, 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 the most attractive, virtuous young women of the kingdom are in this beauty contest, and whoever wins is going to be the queen. Esther is in the contest, and Esther wins the contest. And Esther becomes the queen. Now remember, no one knows that Esther is a Jew, and, and, and so she doesn't reveal that to anyone or to the king himself. So the king is not even aware that she's Jewish. And so she becomes the queen, she has been brought up by a man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai is really her cousin, but he's really more like her dad because he brought her up. And, 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 and Mordecai doesn't tell the king or anybody in the government that, that he's a Jew. Only Haman knows this. So in the meantime, Haman gets promoted to this high position and he hates the Jews, especially Mordecai. And Haman talks the king into making a decree that all the Jews can be killed on sight, and Haman puts up his own money for the bounty. Now, Mordecai goes to Esther. She's the queen, remember. And he says to her, you need to go to the king and tell him that you're Jewish and that this law that's, that, that's just been signed is going to kill you and your people. And Esther says to Mordecai, I'm, I'm afraid to do that because the king has not called for me. And the law was, if, if the king didn't call for you, you didn't go to the king. If you went to the king and were not called, you better hope that he's pleased with that and that he holds out his golden scepter and receives you well. If he doesn't, <laughs> your history. So she says, I'm, you know, it's been 30 days and I haven't even been before the king. I haven't even seen the king in 30 days. 
And so Mordecai says, well, you, if you don't do this, this is gonna be a, a terrible thing for all of us. Let, let me just read it to you. Chapter four, verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And here's that famous quote out of the book of Esther. Yet, who knows whether you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, gather all of the Jews who are present in, in uh, Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Esther goes before the king. And when she goes before the king, he's happy. He sees her and he says, is that you, Queen Esther? And he holds out the golden scepter. He said, come, come. And, and, he, and he has her come down and he says, what, what is it that you would like? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. And she says to him, um, I would like, to, I wanna, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what I want. But, but, but first, I would like for us to have uh, a banquet. And in that banquet, I want it to be only me and you and Mr. Haman. And the king says, hey, groovy, that's fine with me. And so everything's good for Haman now, except verse nine, chapter five, look at it. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and he called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. Then Haman told them of this great, of his great riches. Um, he's just bragging about his riches. You can see just he's so full of himself and pride. Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above all the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, besides, besides Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared, and tomorrow... I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. So he's invited to the party. They're there. Everything's going good. The king, they're happy. Esther's talking to him. They're all, you know, dinner party and all this stuff and, and smoozing and politicizing and all of that. And everything goes good. And the king says, all right, all right, uh, Queen Esther, what is it that you would like? You said you would tell us tonight what you would like. And she said, well, wait, let's do this one more time. Let's do it tomorrow night again. And then I'll tell you tomorrow night, let's just have one more of these parties. So here goes Haman and he's home and he tells everybody, I'm going to another party tonight. So Haman is heartbroken because Mordecai is still disrespecting him, and so his wife, Zeresh, makes an awful suggestion. Look in verse 14. Then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high. That's 75 feet, by the way. That's a high hangman's noose there, isn't it? 75 feet high, and in the morning suggested the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. So out there in his yard now, Haman has built gallows to hang Mordecai on 75 feet high right out there beside his house. So thus far we've seen haughty Haman, hateful Haman, hilarious Haman, heartbroken Haman. I mean, sin never satisfies, right? No matter how much you get, it never satisfies. It's always gonna be more. 
I mean, don't think the current state that we're in now, if it did get satisfied, anything that, that's being talked about, it wouldn't be enough. There, there would be something else immediately. Now, we're gonna meet humiliated Haman. Uh, remember, God's people are praying and, and Esther has, is telling them to fast and pray now. So God's people are praying. And now in Esther chapter six, let's re, let me read this to you. That night, the king, now, now remember, they had a banquet. She said, let's have another one tomorrow night. Okay. So that, during that night, here's what happens. That night, the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. It's like a history of the kingdom. Stuff gets written in there that happens, and the king, unless he reads it, he, he might not even know that it happened. So he, he says, man, I can't sleep. Uh, bring in the book of uh, the history and read it to me. So verse two, and it was found written that Mordecai had told Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the door, that the doorkeepers uh, sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So Mordecai reveals a plot that these two guys are gonna try to kill the king. And he turns them in and they get taken care of and the king is not hurt. Well, the king doesn't know anything about that until now. Then the king said, verse three, what honor of dignity has been, been, has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, who's in the court? In other words, look out there. Is anybody in the building out there? Anybody in the, in the courtyard out there? Of course, who's out there? Haman, why? He's coming to ask the king if he can hang Mordecai on those gallows he just had built. Who's out in the court, he says. Um, uh, now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servants said to him, Haman's there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> so see, he thinks the king's asking him what should be done to honor him. This is, this is, this is how blind you can get now, full of pride. Full of... And Haman answered the king, verse seven, for the man whom the king delights to honor let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done, for the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> oh, devil, he always wants to be crowned and honored, doesn't he? Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you've spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered. <laughs> so the tide begins to turn, right? <laughs> All right God, listen, God will not fail his own. No weapon formed against you will prosper God says, I got your back. And in the end, Satan's gonna be humiliated. I, I know you probably don't need to read this passage, but I wanna read it because I like to, anytime I can humiliate Satan, I like to do it. Uh, Isaiah 14, look at what it says. You'll like this. Isaiah 14, 
talking to Satan, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? In other words, I know a lot of people say, man, Satan is the prince of hell and he's the big man and he's the boss man in hell. And we, I, you know, I don't want to go to heaven with all of you little sissy-fied, wing-ding Christians. I'd rather go to hell and party down there with the devil. You're going to look at him and you're going to be so disappointed that that little worm is the one who has done all this destruction. You're going to say, is that the man? That little dried up piece of junk laying right, that's the one who, who caused the earth to tremble? Humiliated. He's going to be humiliated. Uh, Revelation 20, 10, just one verse. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's his end. Haman's in, Satan's in, and all of those that follow Satan, their end will be to lose. You follow him, you know, you're a loser. One of our presidents, Woodrow Wilson, said a uh, famous quote, I would rather, see if I can get it right, I would rather temporarily lose with a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed, temporarily succeed with a cause that will ultimately fail. And if you're on the devil's side, you're on the losing side. Of course, I know you all know that. All right, let's look at the last little characteristic. The, we, we call him hanging Haman. <laughs> Did anybody guess that that was gonna be the word? In your blank? Hanging Haman. All right, time for the second banquet now. Haman and the king, now remember, Haman and the king do not know that Esther is a Jew. All they know is that Mordecai has saved the king's life. So Haman, I'm sure already has indigestion, but he's already accepted the invitation and it's too late to, to back out. So here it comes, chapter seven, verse one. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted for you. And what is your request up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Ooh, a spider trapped in his own web. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? In other words, the king come back in and Haman's fallen across the couch crying and weeping and begging for his life. And the king thinks he's assaulting Esther. Right there in his own house, as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. 
You know it's not good for him. Now Harbana, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, look, the gallows, 75 feet high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. Last week, I talked about Galatians 6, 7. You remember? Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I don't know a clearer place to see the truth of that. You remember what it means? Don't, don't live in deception. Don't believe these lies that are being told you and turn your nose up at God as if they're nothing. They're right. This is how life happens. This is what God does. And sowing and reaping is all. And, and here's a man that reaped what he sowed. Haman's living high, wide, and handsome. Thought he was getting away with his sin. Thought he was getting away with his life. The mills of God, what is it say, oh, saying? The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind uh, extremely fine. You know, what, you know what Haman needed? Haman needed a savior. And he didn't have one. But you do have one. And you do have a choice. I know everybody in here has probably been confronted with their own salvation many, many times. But let me just assure you that these days that we're in now are extremely difficult days. And they seem to be getting worse very quickly. Uh, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. But I do believe from what the scripture says that we are hastening toward some very tough days. I'm not predicting anything because I know better than that. But I believe God has a place for us and he's coming to get us before all of this terrible stuff happens, before the ultimate terrible stuff happens. But I don't know how close we're gonna be before he actually gets us. So we can certainly see the four glimmerings of, of a world that is like the kingdom that Esther and Mordecai lived in, where everything was controlled by the enemy and only God's deliverance saved them. God's gonna keep his word. I, I think that's why the book of Esther appears in the scripture. God's trying to assure us, look, I take care of my people. It might look bad for you, but I got your back. Don't ever think that, I'm, that I've deserted you or that I don't have control of this stuff. It might look like the government's in charge. It might look like some evil people are involved. It might look like the world order is gonna do this or that or whatever. It might look like all of that is legit and it's gonna, it's gonna be a problem for you, but I got you back. For no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you, I'm gonna put down. For this is the inheritance of the children of God. And I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I'll do what I say. So I just want you to be encouraged some. I mean, this is a light-hearted look at, a, at an interesting story with a tremendous drama in it. And who would have thought that's in the Bible? But there it is, because God wants us to know this. So just bow your head with me one second.